here to help out. So I will be introducing Jennifer in a moment. I will be telling you all how this will work. And toward the end, I'll be doing a um, leading the question and answer session. So we have here today, Jennifer Samet. She is an art-based historian, curator, and writer. She's the director of research at the Eric Firestone Gallery in New York City. And I will let her tell you all a little bit more about herself momentarily. Um, and she's gonna be sharing their current exhibition with us. Um, in the meantime, and while you listen to the presentation, I would encourage you to write any questions that come to you in the chat. Um, if you have trouble finding that, you can roll your mouse down to the bottom of the screen and there's a little talk bubble that says chat. You can click on that and then type your question, type your thought. It's a good way to save it so that you can listen with both ears and your brain. Um, but we will also have time at the end for you to speak your questions out loud if you choose to. So you can ask either way. We'll be saving those questions until the end. And um, then we'll be discussing them with Jennifer. So um, we have a hard stop at six o'clock for both her and me. Um, so we'll be ending a, a, at least a couple minutes before six. Um, with that, I'd love to turn it over to Jennifer. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for um, being here and for having me. Um, okay, should I just begin? Yes. Okay, Okay. great. Um, so welcome to Eric Firestone Gallery in New York. We're on 40 Great Jones Street, downtown New York. Um, and this is an exhibition that is on view through April 10th. Um, and it's called Mosaic is Light work by Jean Reynal. Um, it's work that was made between 1940 and 1970. So right now, um, you can see I'm in one of the rooms of the gallery. Um, and it's the room that has some of the earliest mosaics in the exhibition. Um, it has mostly work from the early 50s, but there is uh, also a work in this room from 1940 as well as a um, piece that's a table collaboration with Isamu Noguchi that was made in 1943. So I'm gonna sort of switch. Um, oh, people are saying that, that they can't um, see me. Um, I have... I, will, you, I can see you, which means most people can. So I'll do the technical troubleshooting over on the side. And if you okay. do, you, you can completely ignore the chat and just talk okay. to us and I will, I will interrupt you if I need to. Okay, so I have that screen pinned, but I'm going to um, actually switch um, devices so that I can take you around. Um, so maybe um, Emily, if you can, Repin, um, or I can do it here. I think replace pin. So for so. of you listening, um, if you would like to see Jennifer's cell phone screen larger, you can click that square on your gallery view, and then there will be a, a list of options, and you can press pin. Then that'll be the one that you see as the largest. Okay, sorry, I thought that would um, pin for everybody, but Zoom. Anyway, thank you. Um, so I've just taken you over to see, hopefully that you're seeing this. Um, this is 1940 work by Jean Renault. Um, it was actually, she had a very interesting um, career and this work was actually shown in her 1941 exhibition at the San Francisco Museum of Art. So just a little bit about um, Jean Reynaud's background. Um, she actually kind of almost got into mosaic by like a series of happenstance events. Uh, she came from a, actually like a very wealthy family um, and was born in Westchester uh, and she rode horses actually as a young adult. And um, okay, people are still saying they can't see the mosaic, but hopefully we can get that figured out. 
sort no, it out. You continue, um, but let me, okay. let me tell everyone. So this may be a little bit confusing because Jennifer has two devices right now on the Zoom. So one is the one that's showing her in the room and the other is a close up of a piece of mosaic work that's bouncing around a little bit because it's a handheld cell phone. So if you all pin the mosaic picture, you'll be able to see what she's showing us. Okay. Also, if it's really hard for people, I can just go back to the computer and share my screen where I do have like just images of everything. But um, try this. Okay, we'll try this. Okay. All right. So just keep me posted. Okay, so a little bit about um, her background. So I was saying she um, rode horses and she was recuperating from a riding accident and was sent by her family abroad. And she ended up in um, London and met a mosaicist who was, he was a Russian mosaicist. His name was Boris Anrep. Um, and she met him and she ended up following him to Paris and becoming an apprentice um, in his studio and working with him on mosaics for um, the floor of the Bank of England. And you can see in this 1940 piece that here still she's working with a sort of relatively traditional um, method of mosaics in that the stones are generally um, flat and sort of arranged in, in a kind of shape. Um, but as she moves like into the 1950s, I'm just gonna move over here. Um, you can see that the way that she's working her process and the size of these tiles and stones really changes. So she starts working with um, these smaller tesserae and really arranging them in a more spontane spontaneous and intuitive manner. So she also, when she was in Paris, she, she ended up being there for eight years from 1930 to 38. And she met the surrealist artists in Paris who ended up basically you know, following her back to the United States because by that time um, it was the war years. So a lot of those artists um, were in exile in the US or in New York. Um, she was really influenced by surrealism and sort of the idea of the unconscious and the intuitive playing a part in her work. Um, and also she was meeting the abstract expressionist artists. And here you can see another early work in the show. This is actually a collaboration with Noguchi. He designed the table and she did the mosaic top. Um, and I should also say that um, by 1940, um, both of her parents had died. And I mentioned that she came from this wealthy family and she ended up inheriting um, money, enough money to become a significant patron of her friends. So this collaboration with Noguchi in some ways was actually a form of patronage in that she was basically commissioning this table of his design and then creating the mosaic for the top. Um, also in these works from the early 50s, you can see um, the influence of an artist who was one of her very close friends and um, that was Arshel Gorky and her use of this kind of biomorphic shape and form that she uses throughout these works. And in these, um, you know, I'm, I know I'm talking to an audience who actually knows a lot about mosaic. Um, in these works, I'm not sure if I really said this, um, she's using a direct method of working directly with her stones into the wet cement. So in other words, not the reverse method that she was um, sort of trained with, trained in with Boris Unwrap. Um, she's also really treating the surfaces and these works like paintings as much as mosaic in that the pigmented cement that she worked with is really an important component of the work. So the, the grounds themselves and there's work 
actually you can see here in this one where there's a very, very scattered application of tesserae. And really it's, it's as much about this ground of pigmented cement as it is about the tesserae. And apparently it was Gorky who actually um, encouraged her to work with the smaller tesserae. I think I started to say this, but maybe didn't finish that she was, you know, an important patron of her friends. And one thing that's interesting is that she um, acquired the first Jackson Pollock painting um, to, be, to be sold. It was a 1941 Jackson Pollock painting and which she acquired from Peggy Guggenheim Gallery. And I've gone back to this mosaic in the corner because she became, during her years in San Francisco, she was, so she was in San Francisco during the war years. And then after that, she moved um, back to New York. But um, she became involved with the first, um, you know, she developed a friendship with the first director of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, who was a woman, which is kind of amazing because this was still the 40s. And she helped advise her on her collection and on the collection of the museum. And she advised the museum and the director to look at the work of Jackson Pollock, who was still basically unknown to the director at that time. And with that sort of encouragement, the director ended up um, making a show of Jackson Pollock. And Raynal was also responsible for um, early exhibitions of Gorky and Noguchi in, at that museum as well. Okay. Is this working okay now or are we still having trouble seeing? Should I proceed? I, I can see fine. I'll wait okay. for others to respond if they're having trouble. Um, I will I say can... it's a little bit shaky and I wonder okay. if you have something like a stool that you could rest the phone on in front of each piece. Um, I don't, but okay. um, we can also um, go back to this other view um, and I can repin this, replace pin. Um, and I can bring this computer now into the other room of the exhibition um, and leave it steady. I, I missed the beginning. Could you tell us where the exhibition is? The exhibition is in New York. Um, it's in downtown New York at Eric Firestone Gallery, which is at 40 Great Jones Street. Which gallery? Eric Firestone Gallery, oh, okay. which is um, at 40 Great Jones Street in New York. Okay, thank you. Okay, so for those of you who are um, still on the cell phone as your pinned one, Jennifer switched to her, um, her computer, which is much more stable. So if you go back to gallery view, if you're out of it and you choose the one that now has a big blue rectangle on the left and a red shape on the right, then you pin that and unpin the other, you'll have a great view. If you're having trouble, text me in the chat. Could, could you could you put in the chat the the name of the gallery and the address because I could uh, want to go to New York and see the exhibit? When we do our question and answer at the end, let's um, make sure that gets um, shared. In the meantime, I'd love to hear the rest and see the rest. Um, and thank you for stabilizing the camera. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so now we are in um, actually the sort of front um, room of the gallery. And we're seeing two bodies of work by Raynal. Um, the works that are the monochrome mosaics that are in the perimeter of the room are all from 1959. But the um, standing sculptural works, these totems, are from about a decade later. So those are from 1969 to 70. Um, so by the time that she, by the time of these monochrome works from 59 she actually did um switch her cement mixture so she was using um sorrel cement in those early 1950s works and by 1959 she was using portland cement 
I'm going into detail because this is a mosaic group. Um, and the Portland cement kind of gave her that white ground to really start with so that she could get this beautiful monochrome color that you see in these works. And you can really see um, by you know these 1959 works sort of what I was um, saying, this very like intuitive way of working, um, the very scattered use and application of the tesserae in these works. Um, and she's also working with, um, I know there was, a, there was a question in the chat and I can just address that about what kinds of material um, are the tesserae. And they're a combination. So they're, um, they're the traditional Venetian glass um, that's called the smalti that she works with, but she's also collecting stones from all of her travels. And, you know, she was a world traveler. And as I mentioned, she sort of started her career on the West Coast and she even had a, a little um, ski cottage in the high Sierras in California. So there's definitely stones that I've been told are volcanic stones that come from that area. Um, um, and you can see in those monochromes and as well as the um, totems that she's incorporating shell, big pieces of shell. Um, and so in the monochrome works, it's a smaller um, Japanese shell, she called it. And then by the time she's making these totems, she's incorporating these really these large pieces of mother of pearl that you can see. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you for one moment mm -hmm. just because people are still, some people are still having trouble seeing and it's not your tech. So let's just see if we can um, troubleshoot and then you can continue. Um, so I would like to see a show of hands who cannot see what we're being shown in the gallery. Physical hands, wave your hand around if you cannot see. Okay, I see at least Susan. Um, can you click on gallery view? Oh, and I see Angel too. So everyone who's having trouble, click on gallery yeah. view and you'll I see did. lots of little boxes. And then you'll see one of them. If you click left or right, you'll see Jennifer Samet's name and you'll see the gallery itself in the image. Right. Okay, so click on that. And it should say pin. I don't see a pin anywhere. I'm do sorry, but little, I, do you see three little dots? When you I just, use the three little dots, it switches to gallery view. Okay, so oh, you know what? It's I found it by clicking on my name, the, the pin. I don't know if it works okay, the same. You can for, do that as well. So you can go to participants or click on um, the name in the box, either one, and then choose Jennifer Samet and click it. Maybe you'll see pin there as an option. If you do choose it, if not, because Jennifer is using the same device now to talk through, are you using the same? Are you talking into your computer? Well, I no, saw but I can't, I can switch. when she was using the phone, but now when she switched to the laptop, I don't see it. And so okay. I don't understand. I don't see any pin thing. And I'm really sorry for no, being it's so. Not, it's not just <laughs> you. So um, Je Jennifer. Can I suggest, I, I, I just double touched the spot and it and pin came up as an option like just okay. i double double click on the gallery double click worked thank all you all right okay is anyone yes. else still not seeing it can i ask you to okay susan's got it i'm going to assume that everyone's got it if you do not then you can um just send me a message in the chat okay thank you for the pause let's get back to it yeah i'm sorry that it was so complicated um so, um, okay, so we were just talking about the, um, the different kinds of um, materials that she uses in the mosaics and, um, and sort of how her work evolves um, by the late 50s when she's making the monochrome works and then a decade later with these totems. Um, and she was also thinking about how um, we considered mosaic in terms of fine art and as a medium because she one of the things she of course bumped up against was that mosaic was considered craft she was really involved with um as i said the surrealists the abstract expressionists she definitely wanted her work to be seen in those kind of contexts um she 
wanted her earlier work certainly to be seen closer to um, being like a painting, as I mentioned. But by the time that she's working on, um, you know, in this and on these totem pieces in the late 60s, obviously she's starting to think of them as sculptural objects. So these are all um, cement with a uh, steel um, infrastructure. Um, and again, incorporating all of the different types of tesserae and stones. Um, she went, she, I mentioned she was a world traveler. She traveled all across the United States, the Southwest. She also went to, um, she went, through South America, Central America, um, and Russia. In 1967, she made a trip to East Africa. Um, and this body of work, these totems are all really based on that experience of going to East Africa. She was in Uganda, she was in Tanzania, um, Kenya, and Ethiopia. So these works really kind of bear that influence, but she was really interested in indigenous art throughout her travels um, and her experiences. Um, okay, uh, how are we doing for time? I, there's also another room of the exhibition that I can take you down to. I think we're okay, right? Yeah, we're On doing time? great for time. We have more than a half hour left. Um, but while you're in this room, I had a request mm -hmm. from someone to maybe sure. see the totems a little bit closer as you go. Um, and yeah. also a question about whether they're flat, but I'm not sure if that question's about the side pieces or the totems. So okay. if you could just show well, as we move to the other room, maybe you can show us the, the pieces. Yeah. Um, so this is sort of why I was doing the yeah, two devices. Um, so hopefully this kind of works for people, but if it doesn't also I can, so now you can, so I switched to my phone. So if you um, all wanna choose that that other image you can to get your close ups, but if you wanna stick with the gallery view, you can just see it, see the whole, the whole room. Yeah. So these are, so we installed these, you know, as, as a group and we created this sort of rock garden that mm -hmm. hopefully you can see here, mm -hmm. um, but that's not original. Um, the works were shown um, as groups. They were, there were two exhibitions of her, of these totems. One of them was um, at Betty Parsons Gallery, which was an important gallery in New York. Um, and that was in 71. And she also showed these at the Newport Art Association in 71. And um, can you see the I red hope, and the blue pieces closer as well? Of course, yeah. Um, and hopefully I really kind of communicated to you, um, she was really at, like in the center of the art world and was someone who, so this is the blue piece up close. She was someone who um, hosted, was known for hosting dinner parties and gatherings. And she really was connected to everyone sort of in the center of the art world. Kooning, Pollock, Gorky, Barnett and Newman. Um, and you can see here, hopefully, as I get up close, these pieces of shell that are actually in this piece, they're dyed blue so that she really gets this overall monochrome. And this piece as well, it was shown multiple times. It was actually originally seven, six or seven panels. Um, it was in an exhibition at the NYU um, Art Center in 61. It was in her Betty Parsons show in 1959. And then there was also an exhibition later on in 65 that was organized again by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art um, that traveled to 
um, the Sheldon Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska. That was around 65, 66. And one of these panels was in that show as well. So, um, so her work was pretty, yeah. And while we're here on this view, I will, I wasn't sure if I would be able to show you this, but I'm in movement, motion, so I will. Um, this is right in the front of the gallery. And this is a piece called Amarillo. It's from 1960. And it has an interesting history. So it's named after the city in the Texas panhandle called Amarillo. And she went there um, originally because there was an exhibition that same year, 1960, um, that was about abstract expressionist women artists, which is, you know, itself very interesting piece of history. And it was supposed to be organized by the artist Elaine de Kooning, but Elaine de Kooning got sort of busy with other projects and she asked Jean Renault to take over the organization of the show. Um, it had several artists in it, including Jane Freilicker and Miriam Shapiro and Pet Pazla. Um, and Raynal actually developed an ongoing relationship to the place, to Amarillo, Texas, and had um, a gallery there called Dord Fitz Gallery. That was where this show of Abex women was. And so she went back several times um, to work with that gallery and also to teach um, classes and demonstrations on mosaic. I'll just take you up close so that you can also get a sense of the way that she's applying the cement. Can you see that? These kind of, they're almost like folds, the way that she's troweling on the cement in this purposefully, um, you know, rough and sort of uneven surface. So she was really, I mean, one of the things that's, I think, most important and sort of radical about Raynal is that in many ways she was countering our expectations of what mosaic is and what it can be in the sense that there, there was an expectation that it was sort of neat and orderly and flat, but she really goes against that. And we titled our exhibition Mosaic is Light because that, that, was, that was a phrase that she used, mosaic is light. Um, she, I don't think I have said this yet, but um, the other thing that changes between the 1940s and the 1950s in her work that you can see is she never applies the tesserae um, completely flat. So they're always kind of set into the concrete on a bias. And that was so that she could achieve that stated goal of having the stones really reflecting um, the light. And, you know, so it was about making, um, creating light through mosaic and also making modern this ancient medium and applying some of those ideas and philosophies of abstract expressionism of working intuitively, spontaneously into the work. Um, another thing that I've thought a lot about is sort of when you really see these tesserae, there's almost like a sense of, I, I've been thinking this, um, sense of like danger um, or something dangerous in her work, which I think even though they're so beautiful and that's really, you know, people talk about just how beautiful and resonant and light folks they are. But I've been thinking about like the weight of them, um, the way that these pieces of glass are sometimes, you know, sticking out from the surface. And I think that really comes from, again, like the ideas of surrealism that art isn't just about beauty, but there's this kind of interchange of like danger and beauty, or maybe something even like edging on um, repulsive along with being beautiful in the interchange of those impulses. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to um, move my setup downstairs now um, because that is where the exhibition continues. So I will just stop the video here. And Okay. Um, okay. I can't remember anymore which one is spotlighted or um, is that not? We can, okay. we can change that as we need. So okay. You okay, can great. On either. Okay. Um, but hopefully many of you now can see another area of the gallery. Yes. Okay, so now we're back on the gallery view, not the cell phone. So if you need to unpin and repin, you can do that. And I can also just, I can leave this up and then um, put my video on here too, as well, um, to make it easier for people. Okay, so um, we're down, we're in the downstairs room of the gallery now. And the work in this room is mostly from the 1960s. So, um, you know, I'm going to take you around. This is a piece called Winter Count. And you can see that this piece also has the larger pieces of Mother of Pearl, as well as actually a huge chunk of obsidian that you can see there. Um, and this as well, you can see how much she's working with that pigmented cement and again how on you know deliberately uneven the surfaces are here as well I think of them also as being almost like topographies um I think that she was really interested in you know the land and also how maybe the landscape looked um, from above, if she was flying and looking at it. Um, but they're really, they seem to me, um, I was about to say paintings, but mosaics that are about the earth and the elements. And really, um, you know, surfaces that are touched by the elements is one way that I think of them. Like kissed by the rain, the sun, the wind. And this is a group of work that she made um, in the mid 60s. So um, these she called discs, and these are freeform works, as you can see, that have the wire infrastructure, the cement, and then all kinds of different tesserae, poured glass, the bigger pieces of mother of pearl, smaller pieces of shell. And these are double-sided as well. And this work here is um, called Mother and Children Between Sun and Moon. Um, we created a little installation in the gallery of some of the ephemera and archival materials because it's so interesting um, to look at her history. Um, she was included in a really important exhibition of um, surrealism that was in 1947 um, at the Hugo Gallery. It was called Blood Flames. We have some of the jewelry that she wore. And you can kind of see in her jewelry as well, a little bit what I was suggesting, that sort of like dangerous beauty almost of um, the jewelry made of bone or teeth. She was known as like an unbelievable 
um, dresser in terms of her the clothing that she wore and her jewelry. Very, very unique person. Um, I think it could be good now to like sit down, I guess, and take any questions. Um, I definitely saw some questions popping up. Yep, that sounds um, great. But maybe before you sit down, I have a request mm -hmm. here to see a close up of the red and gold mosaic on the wall next to that one more time. Is that the? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. The mother and. I assume so. This one, the mother and children. Yeah, this is a great piece. And was in that exhibition in 1966 in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, where she also did two. Um, commission mosaics for the state capitol building. So she did a few on um, not, you know, her career wasn't really made up of the commissions, but she definitely did a few commission pieces. Um, two church mosaics, one in North Palm Beach, Florida, and one in New York. Hmm. And these um, mosaics for the state capitol building. One of them was really not received well, <laughs> um, probably because it was so abstract. Um, and there, there's a request to see the one with all the mop. I don't know what that means. Hmm. Can um, Joanna, can you clarify? Mother of Pearl. Oh, the mother of Pearl. Oh, I thank you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known that, okay. Um, so I think you mean this one, which is called Winter Count. Um, yeah. There's definitely, there's a few pieces that are like this with this sort of, it's almost like a, it's almost like a big dipper or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this form of the mother of pearl goes across. It's actually interesting. I hadn't really thought of it, but just talking and thinking of like the Big Dipper, you know, the idea of like constellations. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really thought of that before, but I'm just thinking out loud that that could be something that maybe interested her too, in terms of creating light and these constellations almost because they're they're so loosely scattered. It's almost like stars in the night sky. All right, thanks for the close-ups. Sure, um, and I can uh, answer more about like the process if you guys. Yeah, have there questions. are a couple of questions about process. Um, okay. So why don't we, as you sit down, perhaps mm -hmm. you could um, start by just telling us one more time slowly the name of the gallery and the address in case anyone does want to visit. Sure, I can also. Um, or you can type it in the chat. I can, I'm going to type it in the chat as I say it. Okay. Um, I think for some reason. Oh, here's everyone. Okay, great. All right. Firestone Gallery. Um, 40 Great Jones Street. Okay. okay, so on oh, the through um, April 10th. Great. All right, so um, we have a technical question, which is, um, do you know how she tinted the cement? Pam's asking. She added pigment um, to her cement mixtures. So you while she was thing? mixing the cement, mm -hmm. um, I actually don't know what type of pigment it was, but... Um, Oops, lost my headphone. Okay. <laughs> this is the kind of trouble you're gonna get in if you're talking to a group of mosaic artists. Um, yeah. Um, um, so um, there, I, there, is, there is this what book. What is um, the I'll just... name of the gallery again? It's not oh, it's in the book. chat. It's um, mm -hmm. Eric Firestone Gallery. Eric Firestone Gallery. Earth Firestone? Mm -hmm. If you look yeah, in the chat, like fire yeah. and stone, it's really easy. Or like the tires, if that's <laughs> fire and stone. Yeah. Exactly. Nice uh, and simple. Okay. 
this and book, um, she does have recipes for her um, cement. Ooh. Um, so basic formulas I'm showing you. Mm -hmm. And she may have, she may say what kind of pigment it is. She talks about it being dry color. I don't know if that means anything to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, if you find any more details, I'm sure we'd love to hear. Um, in the meantime, I'd love to open this up. If you all have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, oh, and I see one. Um, but but you're also welcome to, after we answer Cynthia's question, to um, unmute yourself and ask your questions that way. It might feel yeah, a little bit more I had a question because it was, I'm looking at these and they're large and she's working direct into cement. So I wondered if she treated the cement like a palette and did the coloring, and then she just placed the, the stones, the tessera that's all pre-cut into the different areas. It's very, or if she just, you know, put pieces of tessera in and then did the, the tinting. Oh, no, she mostly, she, she mixed the pigment into her cement mixture, troweled that, in, you know, she was working with, um, you know, sort of a frame and like a wire infrastructure that was laid flat. And so then she was laying in the cement, it had the pigment already um, in it. She had all of her, she would have had all of her stones that she planned to use pre-cut by that time and, and near her so that she could work quickly. Yeah. Um, and then she would, what she would do is she would sort of, she called it seeding them. Um, so she was scattering them yeah. okay. loosely. And then, and then as she was figuring out the compositions, then she would hammer them in and set them, set the stones in. And also because she was hand cutting all of the tesserae, she would end up with this kind of um, dust that she would also scatter into the pigment. She was there so are, the first time. <laughs> yeah. Um, there were occasions when, so she would also work back into um, the mosaics if she wanted to or needed to. She was unhappy with certain areas. She would sort of dig out the tesserae and then apply a thin layer of cement and then work back into that area. I think there are occasional times when she would brush on or add color onto the surface, um, but that's rarer than the normal way that she was working with um, creating those, the pigmented cement, you know, first. Thanks. Um, okay, I have two, two questions, one quick and one not mm -hmm. so much. Um, Joanne is wondering um, if you can just tell us the title of that book in case we wanna look for it, that you held up with the recipes. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I can put it in the chat as well, but it's um, the okay. mosaics of Sean Renault. Straightforward. Um, and hopefully you can find it. I don't know how many copies are still floating around because it was published in 1964. Mm -hmm. But you know how you can like buy books these days on ABE books and mm -hmm. Amazon even. Um, and how is, it, how is it called? Excuse me. I'm putting it in the chat. Um, and then the other question that's come up. Um, oh, okay. We have a few. So Cynthia is wondering how the idea for this show came about. Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we, so our gallery um, really tends to work with these estates and artists who we consider to be very significant historical figures um, like Raynal, but who may have um, been in one way or another under recognized or under acknowledged. And Raynal is definitely an example of that. Like when you really like dive into her biography and her story and her work and her exhibition history, um, you realize how, as I was saying, how central she was to this story. However, this work has not been shown, not been visible since her lifetime. It's just been in storage. 
Um, there are works that you might have come across or have seen in the last few years. There's work, I didn't say this, but one of the works upstairs is um, on loan from the Whitney Museum of Art in New York. However, it hasn't been on view, I don't think, any time since it was, it was acquired, which was back in the 50s. But there is a work also in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art um, that has been on view a couple of times. There's a piece that's in the collection of um, LACMA that was on view in the last five or so years. Um, but so that kind of a story um, is really interesting to us as a gallery. Um, we represent um, the estate of an artist named Joe Overstreet. And when we were working on all of the research for um, that show, which was a few years ago, um, we actually came across um, Jean Reynal's husband's work. Um, so Overstreet was an African-American artist and um, I never even said this, but Reynal was married to the artist Thomas Sills, who was also an African-American um, painter. And, and I, I, sh I also should have said that he, you know, because you're asking about some of the technical um, aspects, he helped her a lot with the physical aspects of, you know, the work, which as you can imagine, um, it, you know, it's heavy and logistically difficult um, to work with. Um, so we came across the work of Thomas Sills and by extension, um, Jean Reynal, and we were just really curious about this artist couple. Um, where the woman was working with mosaic in this very um, uni unique way um, and um, Thomas Sills's work. And so we researched at that time. And, you know, if you do any research, if you're an art historian who's do involved with Gorky or Noguchi, um, you'll come across the name Jean Renal because she was so central in their lives. But sort of other than that, it's the mentions are few and far between. Some of you may know about the book that was, has been really popular about abstract expressionist women called Nine Street Women, which came out a couple of years ago, I guess now. Um, she gets one line in that book. Like, you know, it's all about abstract expressionist women. And it's really an aside. It's just to say like, oh yeah, rain all through these great parties. Um, but um, so that's the long answer to how we um, got interested in her work. And um, a few, it took us a while to connect with the family um, and with the estate. Um, and so we had actually started that research a few years ago and then finally really connected with the, with the family um, in the fall and then put this together, you know, pretty quickly considering what it was. <laughs> That's fascinating, thank you. Um, and Roberta had a question about how a lot of the cement is very pockmarked as she put it, mm -hmm. do you know how that texture came to be? Well, I mean, pockmarked, I'm not, I'm sort of like thinking about that choice of the word because do, I don't know if she means um, Roberta, like the- Roberta, unmute and yeah. uh, ask your question out loud? Yeah, um, it, it's very dimpled. Um, mm -hmm. Like usually, you know, if you're, if you're um, laying on cement with a trowel or something, you know, you kind of get it, it kind of, even if you make um, valleys and hills, it's still kind of smooth, but it almost looks like she like sprayed it with something to get it, you know, like it's mm -hmm. very bumpy. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. It's very, these very bumpy, um, rugged surfaces. But um, the cement, I mean, the cement in itself, not just mm -hmm. the way she's embedded the tesserae in it, just the cement yes. itself seems very, I don't know, I was just wondering how she got that. Yeah, no, I agree. The surface of the cement is definitely this uneven, um, um, I was sort of saying like topographic kind of um, like earthy surface. Um, I, from what I sort of can see, I think she was getting that surface just by the way that she was traveling on the cement. Um, she may have used some other tools in addition, um, you know, knife, 
knifing the way that she applied it, but she was definitely after um, a rugged, rough um, surface that I think, you know, invokes something like the earth and not a flat surface. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So we have about five minutes left. We can stretch it a few more, but um, that means if any of you have more questions, now's the time. Would you like to unmute and ask? Uh, yeah, can I ask if we can take pictures in the exhibit if we visit? Yes, definitely. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, one of the things about uh, this technique, putting down the uh, cement and then embedding, um, the, uh, the cement is going to harden. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering if she did these very rapidly or did she put uh, the cement on a certain area, do that and then move to another area? that kind of thing. They look kind of uniform, like she did it all at once. But technically, that seemed like a very difficult thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, she, she definitely was, she had everything ready so that she could really just go. Um, she planned out an idea of, you know, the colors that she wanted to use and the stones that she wanted to use. And and had everything ready so that she could work into that wet cement. But she definitely um, goes against, you know, our expectations with the process of making mosaic because she would indeed um, rework them. So she would um, she would work back into pieces. She would dig out areas of tesserae, reapply a thin layer of cement, and then work back into them. So um, so the answer is sort of both. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Um, I have a question. Um, sure. How heavy are, do you, do you, can you give us a sample? Do you know the weight of one of them just to give us a sense of their total weight? Yeah, they really range in weight. Um, so those earlier 1950s works that are made of the sorrel cement, um, which she used because it would adhere to uh, like a board, basically. Um, those are much lighter than some of the Portland cement works, um, but they're like the big hexagonal red piece that is upstairs, but it's also on the cover here. That's um, the heaviest work in the show. And I think it's over 500 pounds. So we needed to use a, um, like a rigging company for that one. <laughs> so right. Some of them are really heavy. Yeah. Have you hung them with French cleats or do you have a trick? Um, yeah, we're using cleats. We had, um, we luckily have like plywood backed walls in the gallery. So we were able to, you know, hang all of them from the wall. But in her time, I know that she did, you know, depending on the spaces or the venues where she was exhibiting, sometimes they weren't um, hung on the walls. They were, she used a system of um, like stands, like metal stands um, on the floor. And then they would sort of lean against the wall or maybe be at attached to the wall, but also resting on the stands. Um, and one of the early shows actually in 1950, there's a really interesting way that they were kind of like on these stands that went from the, the floor and then also to the ceiling. So I think that was the way of distributing the weight. Hmm. Thanks. Um, and Joanne is asking, um, was there a common type of substrate that she used? You just touched on that in terms of the board, but um, was there something that she used consistently? I mean, I think it changed from that, um, you know, the early work to the, to the, when she was using the sorrel cement where um, she was using like a thicker um, layer of, um, of cement and, and, and encompass, um, incorporating the um, infrastructure, you know, the wire um, 
infrastructure into them. Um, yeah, she did also experimented like that songs of the Tiwa. I think um, it was there was some cracking and she experimented with like a resin, attaching a resin backing to it. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Fascinating. Well, mm -hmm. you're getting a lot of thank yous in the <laughs> chat and um, everyone who said anything agrees that it was a great exhibition. I would like to echo that. I really appreciate your time and your expertise. Um, it's really lovely to hear an art historian talk about this. I think we get to hear other artists talk about mosaic a lot and that's a different perspective. Um, sure. So on behalf of New England Mosaic Society, thank you very much. And um, I, I think we may be finished for today. Is there anything you'd like to say to close out, Jennifer? Um, it was just really nice to, um, to have you visit. And yeah, I thank you for your interest. All right. And please feel free to stay in touch and come visit the gallery if you're in New York. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much again and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.